I'm excited to introduce our speaker uh, here this morning. You know, one of the things that uh, we're sort of celebrating this semester and next semester is the bench at Gordon is very deep. There are a lot of really talented people uh, who are on the faculty and staff here. This morning, our speaker is someone who, with whom a number of you have probably had conversations, right? Or at least conversations with his, with his office. Uh, Dan O'Connell is the Director of Student Financial Services here at Gordon. He's been at Gordon for 15 years and he wears many hats here. Um, he's also a, a graduate of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and has his Master's of Divinity degree there. One thing that most folks here wouldn't know is that Dan was a church planter in uh, Salem for 10 years. He's originally from New York and uh, yes, he's a Yankees fan. And uh, give him a break, pray, pray for him, pray for yeah. But even more than that, more impressive, he's a Jets fan and the Jets have wandered in the wilderness as long as Moses did. So uh, anyway, it's good. we're uh, thrilled to have Dan O'Connell here with us. Dan, come on up. Good morning. It's a wonderful time of worship, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you for that. This is my uh, 15th year at Gordon, and this is the first time I have spoken in chapel about something other than financial aid. So look out, everybody. We're rookie on this one. But what has made my experience here so enjoyable is all the people that I've worked through with all these years. I've had so many interesting conversations. The people here are so smart. And I had a good friend that would always used to remind me of the Chinese curse. Has anyone ever heard of the Chinese curse? Well, to American ears, it sounds like a blessing. It says, may you live in interesting times. May you come to the attention of those in power, and may you get what you want. And the statement that stands out to me is, may you live in interesting times. And I don't know about you, but I think we are living in interesting times. I mean, we have recently come out of a pandemic. There's a war in Ukraine with rumors of more wars. We hear of food shortages, an energy crisis, the climate crisis, and it seems like daily about the rampant corruption of those in power. And then we have these wonderful devices in which all this wonderful news comes to me, which has provided a platform for me, which also creates a constant pressure of managing my own personal profile. We are truly living in interesting times. But my point in bringing this up this morning is not to depress you, but it's to raise the question, how are we to create ripples in these interesting times? When many times it just feels like I'm being pushed by the currents of the ripples created by other people and events. Whoops, there we go. Interesting times up here. The passage we read this morning, I think, provides us with some key insights into answering this question. The passage is the call of Isaiah to be a prophet, and we are told that this call occurred in the year King Uzziah died. And this is an important indicator for us because we know that Isaiah is going to start living in some interesting times. I mean, things were good, and life was stable for many living in the times under King Uzziah. Thank you. I mean, he was a successful military leader. He expanded the borders of his kingdom, and as a result, there was peace and prosperity in the land under his reign. And like the Chinese curse says, many under his rule were getting what they wanted. But they were coming to the attention of those in power. 
the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians were a major military powerhouse, and they had a brutally violent army, and they were dormant for a time, but they were starting to come back to life. And Uzziah's death starts indicating to us that God's people were going to start living in interesting times. The Assyrians were becoming a major threat again, and the reign of the man many had put their faith in, and the times of peace and prosperity were coming to an end. And what I find fascinating here is that at this point, when God's people are at the precipice of living in some interesting times, God doesn't give them money. He doesn't give them a bigger military. He doesn't give them an inside connection with the Assyrian court. Instead, God sends them a prophet. See, God's calling Isaiah to create ripples. And God knew that in order for Isaiah to create ripples during these times, in order for him to have courage and have the ability not only to survive but thrive in his calling, what he needed most was an elevated view of himself. And it's the same for us today. If we're going to have courage and create ripples, we must not only think rightly about God, but we must have an elevated view of him. In his classic work, Knowledge of the Holy, A.D.W. Tozer stresses the importance of this. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. Were we able to know exactly what our most influential religious leaders think of God today, we might be able with some precision to foretell where the church will stand tomorrow. The heaviest obligation laying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. And this will prove more greater value than anything that art or science can devise. When I was five years old, I received a picture of Jesus from my Sunday school teacher. You know, and Jesus had a sheet draped around him with a shepherd's hook. And I kept this picture of Jesus most of my life. This view of God as warm and gentle many times brought me comfort when I was afraid of the dark, and when I was afraid to go to school the next day. But this view of God was completely inadequate to deal with my biggest fears. This view of God certainly could not capture my heart in worship. And it could not sustain my loyalty to him in difficult times. My God was too small. And like Isaiah, in order for us to not be tossed back and forth by the ripples created by other people and events, our view of God needs to be elevated. And I'm not calling for a view to God to be untrue, but to match what God reveals of himself in the Bible. And this is what God does for Isaiah in the vision he gives him. In the vision, there are three things God wants Isaiah to know about himself. The first thing God wants Isaiah to know about him is he is the sovereign ruler of both heaven and earth. First off, I just want to set the context for this vision. Isaiah is getting a glimpse into the heavenly realm, into the unseen realm. So we not only need to get elevate our view of God, we need to elevate our view of the world we inhabit. The Bible testifies of a world we cannot see and of a dimension where the glory of God is clearly seen by numerous creatures who live in that realm. And Christianity does not make sense if this realm does not exist. And the first thing Isaiah sees as he gets a glimpse into the heavenly realm is the Lord sitting on a throne. And two things I want to point out here. The word here for Lord is the Hebrew word Adonai, which is Lord and Master, and it refers to God's sovereignty. And he is sitting on a throne, ruling. 
And God is communicating that he is the sovereign ruler of the universe and that there is nothing outside of his knowledge, there is nothing outside of his control, and there is nothing that happens in both heaven and earth that is outside of his will. And the interesting thing is that in the year King Uzziah dies, Isaiah gets his sight of the true king. The one who rules over not only the things that we can see, but over the things that we cannot see. And so what Isaiah needed and what we need in order to create ripples in our lives is to have our lives completely recentered and recalibrated. We need, in a sense, our own personal, spiritual Copernican revolution where me and my little kingdom ceases to be center stage and God and his kingdom does. See, God's people, they were afraid of the Assyrian armies, but they forgot that God not only rules over the Assyrian armies, but over the heavenly ones as well. And many times I have to remind myself, when things are getting crazy, when things seem out of control, and when things are not going to plan, God has not abandoned his throne. That God is working out his will in both the things that I can see and the things that I cannot see. The second thing that God wants Isaiah to know about himself is that he is the judge over all the earth and that judgment is coming. When you see the throne in a Bible, it means that judgment is coming. And and we get a clue of why it's coming. See, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. And many times throughout the book of Isaiah, we'll see this lifted up language. And it refers to humans who in their pride reject the rule of God on their lives. They do not worship the true king. And they commit injustice against other human beings. Even King Uzziah, who was considered a good king towards the end of his life, was lifted up in his pride, rejected God's laws for worship, and took a role to himself that he didn't deserve. See, God is the true judge of the world. And yes, there is much injustice in the world, and it seems overwhelming, but God, the true judge of all the world, he will judge all injustice and make everything right. And we must not mistake the patience of God as apathy or unconcern. And many of us get angry, and there's so much rage in our culture today because of the injustice that we see. And yes, there is a place for righteous anger. But we need to remind ourselves that the judge of all the earth will judge all things thoroughly, completely, and yes, righteously. And we need to place people into the hands of the true judge to judge rightly. And we can't let this anger and this rage eat us up inside. Otherwise, we're going to be driven and controlled by the ripples of other people and events. The third thing that God wants Isaiah to know about himself is that he is holy. Isaiah sees and hears these angelic beings called seraphim, right? And they're fascinating creatures. But what I want to draw your attention to is what they're saying, or shall I say singing about God. They are proclaiming that he is holy, holy, holy. And in the Hebrew language, when a word is emphasized, it's done for the point of emphasis. But here we have God being said to be holy three times. And there is no other characteristic, no other attribute of God that is repeated in the Bible three times. God is not said to be love, love, love. God is not said to be justice, justice, justice. But here, being said by angelic beings, God is said to be holy, holy, holy. So what does it mean for God to be holy? And I don't think there's another topic that Christians get more wrong than holiness. And I understand why, right? It's kind of hard to wrap your head around holiness. And we have a tendency to look at it very earthly or very simplistic terms. 
view of holiness. I mean, we think about holy people and we say, oh, they're super moral or religious. And since they're super moral and religious, you know, they're kind of separate and kind of standoffish and, you know, kind of judgmental. And then we project upon God this kind of morality, right? So holiness means God's moral purity. And all of this really does is reinforce God's judgment on us. God is morally pure, and since we are not, he needs to judge us. Then holiness becomes something really negative, something that is not glorious and beautiful. And yet, this is not the impression we get when we look at the seraphim. They are enamored, and they're blown away by God's holiness. So the declaration of God's holiness is not an exclamation point that God is the sovereign ruler and judge. It's actually a declaration of the type of being who sits on the throne and is ruling and will judge all the earth. It's saying something fundamental about who God is. So, since holiness is so important, we have to ask, well, what does it mean? God's holiness speaks to his utter uniqueness. God is the creator of all things, and everything else that exists is created. And, and therefore, there is no one like our God. There is no one, and nothing can be compared to him. And why is this so important? Because our biggest problem is that when we think, God thinks like us. When we project on God the way we think, and this is why the scriptures are so vital, if God didn't show us what he was like, then we would be in the greatest danger of projecting onto God our way of thinking. And what a horrible God that would be. A God who is unworthy of our worship and adoration. Yes, God is loving, but if I were to project on God my view of love, it'd be pretty fickle. It'd run hot and cold. It'd be here today, gone tomorrow. If I were to project on God my view of justice, well, it'd probably look a lot like angry vengeance. And we do ourselves a total disservice, and we make God really terrifying if we're going to project on God the way we think. Now, I just gave you a negative definition of holiness, right? I told you that what God is not, right? He is not like anything in his creation. And, and, and this is the biggest problem with understanding holiness, right? Because we want a positive definition. But there are problems in giving you a positive definition of holiness. See, if I give you a positive definition of holiness, like God's holiness is his goodness, then I would have to fall back on a negative definition. And that goodness is a lot different and a lot more, you know, greater than you can ever imagine. Also, the way God applies his goodness is going to look completely different than you think it's going to apply. And I think a great example of this is the way God sees blessing in the Sermon of the Mount. God says, or Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. And we go, that doesn't look like blessing to us. That's because God's understanding of blessing works completely different than ours. Also, the other reason why it's hard to wrap your head around a positive definition of holiness is God actually takes the whole Bible to provide a positive definition of holiness. See, it's throughout the Bible we just see how different God is, the way he treats people, what he says, and what he's done. I mean, I've been reading the Bible for 25 years, and I still get blown away the way God says and does because it's so different. But the question for us here is, how is the uniqueness of God, how is his holiness manifesting itself in this encounter with Isaiah? And I think the reaction that Isaiah has to seeing the Lord is going to give us a clue. For Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, Isaiah, after seeing the Lord, calls down curses upon himself. 
See, he rightly understands that he deserves judgment along with his people. And if God's holiness were merely his moral perfection, then we just would think that God is highlighting his right to judge Isaiah. And then Isaiah should be destroyed. But God demonstrates his holiness in that he chooses to have mercy on Isaiah. And he not only chooses to have mercy on him, he try, chooses to provide Isaiah what he needs to atone for his sin. See, see, God's holiness isn't opposed to his mercy, but in this instance, it's an actual demonstration of it. See, God's holiness speaks to how God is uniquely God. And here he is, blowing Isaiah's mind by being uniquely all-powerful, all just, and all merciful, all at the same time. It's this encounter that should cause us to sit back and wonder at the beauty of God's holiness. I mean, we need a God who is holy in order to capture our hearts in worship. And look at Isaiah. Look at what happens to him. He was cowering in deathly fear. But after the Lord has atoned for his sins, he is now unafraid, listening to the heavenly discussion. And he now has the boldness to say, here I am, Lord. He doesn't say, hide me from the presence of the Lord. Rather, he says, here I am, send me. He has been totally transformed by the holiness God. Now God gives him a really tough assignment. I mean, he's being asked to create ripples in difficult times and in difficult places. And God gave Isaiah this glimpse of himself to elevate his view of him. And having this elevated view of him, he's going to inform his entire ministry. For he will write later, therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. See, God exalts himself, not to smash you. God exalts himself for the purpose of showing mercy. God is also going to use this event and his holiness to remind Isaiah that in order you know, he's going to use this event to give him courage in a tough time. For he says, For the Lord spoke thus to me, with a strong hand upon me, and warned me not to walk in the way of his people, saying, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall regard as holy, and let him be your fear, let him be your dread. See, God's holiness is what we hold on to so that we're not driven by the concerns and the fears of the people around us. See, with having our lives being recentered on him, we can draw courage from the fact that the only one that we should fear, the only one who has the right to judge us, has had mercy on us. And the only thing that we should fear would be disappointing and offending him because he is so gloriously amazing. And like the seraphim, we should be overwhelmed by the beauty of his holiness. And God's holiness will pervade the whole ministry of Isaiah, as I said, but we get another glimpse of it. Later in the book of Isaiah, we read of another one who is high and lifted up. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he shall sprinkle many nations. This is a foretelling of the coming of Jesus Christ. He is that servant. See, God didn't throw out justice when he had mercy on Isaiah. No, God provided what was needed to atone for himself. himself. And the one who is truly high and lifted up, the one who sits in the highest place, is also the one who gets lifted up on a cross to die for the sins of his people. This 
is the beauty of holiness, that the ruler of all, the judge of all, takes up the role of a servant in order to have mercy and pour out his grace on his people. I pray that we would get a sense of our exalted God who has mercy on us and be riveted by his holiness because that is going to sustain us in the tough times ahead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes that we may see your glory. Yes, your holiness can be intimidating, but let us press on knowing that you are merciful. Let us not fear drive us away from you, but let us be propelled to go to your feet. For you long to be merciful and gracious to us. Let this stick with us as we live out our lives today and for the rest of the month. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you. Thank you.